eternal in men is humanity, which, steadily developing, grows richer in passing from one generation to another. I say relatively eternal because our planet once destroyed, it cannot fail to perish sooner or later since everything which has begun must necessarily end, our planet once decomposed to serve undoubtedly as an element of some new formation in the system of the universe, which alone is really eternal, who knows what will become of our whole human development. Nevertheless, the moment of this dissolution being an enormous distance in the future, we may properly consider humanity, relatively to the short duration of human life, as eternal. But this very fact of progressive humanity is real and living only through its manifestation at definite times in definite places, in really living men, and not through its general idea. The general idea is always an abstraction, and, for that very reason, in some sort, a negation of real life. I have stated in the appendix that human thought and, in consequence of this, science, can grasp and name only the general significance of real facts, their relations, their laws. In short, that which is permanently in their continual transformations, but never their material, individual side, palpitating, so to speak, with reality and life, and therefore fugitive and intangible. Science comprehends the thought of the reality, not the reality itself, the thought of life, not life. That is its limit, its only really insuperable limit, because it is founded on the very nature of thought, which is the only organ of science. Upon this nature are based the indisputable rights and grand mission of science but also its vital impotence, and even its mischievous action whenever, through its official licensed representatives, it arrogantly claims the right to govern life. The mission of science is, by observation of the general relations of passing and real facts, to establish the general laws inherent in the development of the phenomena of the physical and social world. It fixes, so to speak, the unchangeable landmarks of humanity's progressive march by indicating the general conditions which it is necessary to rigorously observe and always fatal to ignore or forget. In a word, science is the compass of life, but it is not life itself. Science is unchangeable, impersonal, general, abstract, insensible, like the laws of which it is but the ideal reproduction, reflected or mental, that is, cerebral, using this word to remind us that science itself is but a material product of a material organ, the brain. Life is wholly fugitive and temporary, but also wholly palpitating with reality and individuality, sensibility, sufferings, joys, aspirations, needs and passions. It alone spontaneously creates real things and beings. Science creates nothing. It establishes and recognises only the creations of life, and every time that scientific men, emerging from their abstract world, mingle with living creation in the real world, all they propose or create is poor, ridiculously abstract, bloodless and lifeless, stillborn, like the homunculus created by Wagner, the pedantic disciple of the immortal Dr. Faust. It follows that the only mission of science is to enlighten life, not to govern it. The government of science, and of men of science, even be they positivists, disciples of Auguste Comte, or again disciples of the doctrinaire school of German communism, cannot fail to be impotent, ridiculous, inhuman, cruel, oppressive, exploiting, maleficent. We may say of men of science as such what I have said of theologians and metaphysicians. They have neither sense nor heart for individual and living beings. We cannot blame them for this, for it is the natural consequence of their profession. In so far as they are men of science, they have to deal with and can take interest in nothing except generalities that do the laws. Editorial note. Three pages of the manuscript are missing. End note. They are not exclusively men of science, but are also more or less men of life. End of part two of chapter two.